Well, for, first off, the Bruno Klopfer Memorial Award um, is given for the outstanding long-term professional contribution to the field of personality assessment. Dr. Phoebe Kramer has had a distinguished career as professor of psychology at Williams College and as a private practitioner. She is considered among the leading authorities in the world on both ego defense mechanisms and the thematic apperception test. Dr. Kramer has offered, uh, authored over 100 peer review publications, many of which are on defense mechanisms and their development, including several classic longitudinal studies on defenses. Dr. Kramer has also authored five books, three of which involve defense mechanisms. She's a gifted writer and has helped so many of us better understand defense mechanisms and especially the distinction between conscious coping and unconscious defenses. And this, this was in her classic paper in the American Psychologist titled, The Unconscious Status of Defense Mechanisms. Phoebe is also the first woman full professor and department chair at Williams College, formerly an all men's college. She is an associate editor of the Journal of Research and Personality previous associate editor of the Journal of Personality, and as so many of you know, has been a consulting editor for JPA for many years. On a more personal note, Phoebe is the mother of two daughters and the grandmother of two. She's a world traveler to many exotic places, most recently this fall, to Burma, Cambodia, and Thailand. She is currently a figure skating judge for the U.S. Figure Skating Association, and last but not least, Phoebe Kramer held the world record in swimming for the 100-yard butterfly. Wow. Yeah, isn't that great? <laughs> so I am delighted to introduce the recipient of the Bruno Klopfer Award for outstanding long-term contribution to the field of personality assessment, Dr. Phoebe Kramer. Actually, this is, oh. this is <laughs> squat, squat down so I don't look so short. <laughs> one try, one more. <laughs> it's not the first time I've been asked to do that. <laughs> Well, it's a great honor to be the recipient of the 2014 Bruno Klopfer Award. And in a sense, it brings me around full circle. For when I was a graduate student in clinical psychology at New York University, Bruno Klopfer's book, The Rorschach Technique, was our guide to discover and practice Rorschach interpretation. And here today, I'm back in the company of that outstanding psychologist. So thank you all so much. I thought I'd begin my talk by taking a few minutes to describe how it is that I came to study defense mechanisms. On reflection, I think that there are six strands in my professional history that led me to this area of investigation. First, when I was an undergraduate psychology major at UC Berkeley, I was fortunate enough to participate in our research at the Personality Institute, the Institute of Personality Assessment and Research. And the staff at that time included Jack Block, Harrison Goff, Frank Barron, Donald McKinnon, and Ravenna Helson, among others. During that period, the Institute was engaged in the weekend-long studies of creative individuals such as William Carlos Williams, Truman Capote, Jessamyn West, and other highly creative artists. These weekends included formal assessment and informal interaction with the participants, followed by a series of observational ratings made by the staff at the conclusion of each weekend. This was my introduction to personality assessment, and it was a very exciting beginning. Second, I did my graduate study at New York University in a clinical program 
which at that time was strongly psychoanalytically oriented. I was an assistant at the Research Center for Mental Health, which was engaged in empirical studies of psychoanalytic concepts. My professors included Robert Holt, George Klein, and for one special year, David Rappaport, with whom I had a weekly individual tutorial to study psychoanalytic theory. Rappaport wanted at that time to develop a theory of learning that would fit within the broader theory of psychoanalysis. He focused on the model of thinking presented in chapter seven of Freud's interpretation of dreams. As in the process of free association, this model was based on the idea of an associative network in which activation of one memory would spread to other related memories. This led to the third strand in my professional development. My PhD dissertation was based on this idea of an associative network. Importantly, this kind of mental activity occurred outside of awareness, as is the case for defense mechanisms. My dissertation was a study of priming, demonstrating the spread of activation within predetermined associative networks. This work was published in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology in 1965 <laughs> as the recovery of a discrete memory. And it is, I believe, the first published study of priming. The fourth strand also comes from the time I was a graduate student. During the summers, I worked at Harvard doing research with Henry Murray and Kenneth Keniston. My job was to study the TAT stories of alienated Harvard men to detect recurrent themes in the stories with an eye to using these themes to develop an alienation questionnaire. This was my first experience with the TAT and its possibilities to be followed by formal study with Bob Holt at NYU. The fifth strand occurred post PhD when I began doing research on the cognitive associative processes of priming and semantic generalization. I came to realize that I needed more background and competence for conducting experimental research in cognitive psychology. To that end, I began postdoctoral study at the Institute of Human Learning at UC Berkeley, which was a major center for cognitive research at the time under the guidance of Leo Postman. From that experience, I spent the next 10 years carrying out and publishing cognitive research in the Journal of Experimental Psychology and Memory and Cognition, for which I was a consulting editor. After five years at Berkeley, alternating postdoc with teaching, I began the sixth strand. Along with a continuing part-time clinical practice and clinical supervisory positions, my academic niche became the lifelong teaching of developmental psychology. In this endeavor, my thinking about psychological development was informed by the work of Jean Piaget and his theory that different cognitive operations are characteristic of different periods of child development, and by the work of René Spitz describing from a psychoanalytic point of view how very early mental concepts develop. My course offerings included classes on both normal and disordered development in children. So there we have the six strands that led to my study of defense mechanisms. Learning about personality assessment, the psychoanalytic study, uh, psycho study of psychoanalytic concepts, the investigation of mental processes that occur outside of awareness, the exposure to the TAT, the acquisition of competence for experimental study of cognitive processes, and finally, all of these located within the framework of psychological development. This all coalesced into the study of defense mechanisms as unconscious cognitive operations that change across developmental periods, that have a protective function, and that may be studied using both methods of personality assessment and experimental paradigms. Now here's the working definition of defense mechanism. My study of defense mechanisms began in 1972. I read extensively in the psychoanalytic literature about defenses and defense development. Both Anna Freud and Rene Spitz believed in theory that defense mechanisms emerged in a consistent developmental pattern. 
However, their attempt to order defenses chronologically was not pursued. Other psychoanalytic writers had also suggested that there might be a theoretical hierarchy of defense development, but there was no empirical test of this idea. Subsequently, I formulated two theoretical propositions. First, different defenses are characteristic of different periods of development. And second, each defense will have its own trajectory of development, emerging and becoming predominant at one period, and then becoming less important, followed by the emergence and increasing importance of a new defense, with the process again repeated for yet another new defense. Then I devised a theoretical model. And this is the model that I proposed. Early in life, denial is a prominent defense. As the young child grows older, the use of denial decreases, while the use of projection, a more cognitively complex defense, increases. Projection remains predominant during late childhood, decreasing somewhat in late adolescence. At that time, the more cognitively complex defense of identification, which has been slowly developing since childhood, becomes predominant. Wishing to test this theory, I quickly discovered that there were no appropriate methods available for studying children's use of defenses. That became my first project. So the next step was to create a method to assess defenses. Over the next 10 years, I explored several possible approaches to this end. Eventually, I settled on the use of TAT stories and developed a coding system that could assess the use of the three defenses that I had hypothesized were characteristic of three different periods of child development. In a broad sense, these were the definitions of the three defenses that guided the development of the coding system for the Defense Mechanism Manual. And here, very quickly for each defense, are the seven manifestations of each defense that are used to code the presence of that defense. For denial, for projection, and for identification. Now, let's look at some sample stories from children that illustrate the use of the three defenses. Each of these stories was told to TAT card 17BM, which depicts a man clinging to a rope. Examples of defense use in the stories are underlined. A five-year-old told the following story. It illustrates the use of denial. A statue climbing down a rope. He falls and then breaks. And then somebody builds him back up, and he does the same thing over again. The people have to build him back up and put him back up on the rope, and then he swings down and breaks. Examiner, how is he feeling? He's made of clay. He doesn't. This narrative is unusual in that the central figure, who is almost always seen as a live man, is turned into a statue. However, in reality, statues do not climb. Given the plot of the story, it appears that the storyteller is anxious about the possibility of the central figure falling. To alleviate this anxiety, he turns the figure into something inanimate. If it is not alive, it cannot be hurt and cannot die. Even when it does fall, the denial that this is a man by turning it into a statue makes, the, makes possible the impossible, that the figure may be put back together again. Thus, there's nothing to be feared. However, the anxiety about falling is not put to rest, and the whole process is repeated. The use of denial is made most explicit in the child's closing statement. Because the figure is made out of clay, he doesn't have any feelings, and he is not afraid, and so cannot be hurt. Consider now another story to the same TAT card told by a 10-year-old. In this case, the defensive pro projection is predominant. A man was being chased by a bunch of soldiers who wanted to kill him. He's climbing up the rope, and if he doesn't make it, he'll get chopped to death with swords. So he's hanging as tight as he can, 
And when he gets to the top, he'll be on the border. That's a secret place underground. There's this hatch that's on the border, so they can't get him. Although this story was told of the same stimulus picture, which shows only a single figure clinging to a rope, the storyteller has added numerous hostile soldiers, as well as the need for protection from that hostility. The image of being chopped to death with swords comes entirely from the psyche of the storyteller, as do the soldiers and swords. Concern about places to hide, to protect himself, lead to the cognitive confusion about being either on the top or underground. The focus is on being others being out to get him, and this continues throughout. Finally, consider a third story told to the same picture by a 17-year-old, in which identification is prominent. The young man had committed a crime. He commits, completes the escape. Upon his arrival in England, he works toward ending the world hunger as a self-punishment to make up for the sin he has committed. The opening of the story indicates an incorporation of social mores, that there are laws to follow and to obey. Subsequently, engaging in work becomes important rather than unrestrained gratification, and the work selected has a moral goal to end world hunger. At the same time, this work provides the opportunity for self-punishment as repentance for having disobeyed the law and a recognition that the previous behavior was unacceptable and a sin. The next step was to provide research to test the model. First, the question may be raised whether the coding of defenses using this method could show inter-rater reliability. To jump ahead in time, between 1987 and 1997, 17 different studies using the coding method were carried out. The median inter-rater reliability was 0.81 for denial, 0.80 for projection, and 0.64 for identification. Another eight studies conducted between 1997 and 2010 showed inter-rater reliabilities for the three defenses of 0.78 for denial, 0.84 for projection, and 0.82 for identification. In addition, 10 unpublished PhD dissertations showed similar inter-rater reliabilities. These findings indicate that reliable coding is possible. Reminding you again of the theoretical model, the next step in my work was to determine whether stories told by children of different ages would support the model. To this end, stories from more than 300 children, ranging in age from 5 to 16 years, were collected and coded for use of the three defenses. Because older children typically tell longer stories than younger ones, each child defense scores were converted into relative or proportional scores. In this way, story length did not influence the defense score. The results of this first study revealed the following. Among the youngest group of children, mean age five years or so, denial was used frequently and then decreased sharply across the other age groups. In contrast, the use of projection increased over the childhood years, dropping off somewhat at late adolescence. Finally, identification was used very little by the youngest children, but gradually increased until it became the predominant defense in late childhood, late adolescence, sorry. These results were a good fit with the theoretical model. Ten years later, when I was reading the 1998 volume of the Journal of Personality Assessment, I found a study by a psychologist whom I'd never met who replicated my findings. John Porcerelli and colleagues <laughs> had coded TAT stories from children and adolescents of different ages using the defense mechanism manual. And here are their findings. From age seven, there's a steady decline in the use of denial. At the same time, projection is used consistently throughout late, later childhood and early adolescence, but decreases somewhat in late adolescence. By that time, identification has become predominant, and even more so in college freshmen. The close similarity of these results 
to those of my earlier study was both remarkable and gratifying. <laughs> both of these studies, however, were based on cross-sectional data and do show age differences, but not change with development. Although carried out 10 years apart and in different regions of the country, it's still possible that cohort differences might somehow account for the results. Thus, I conduct conducted a longitudinal study following the same children from age six to age nine and a half. And here are the results of that study. The use of denial decreased steadily over the age range. The use of projection increased beginning at age eight. And the use of identification is at a very low level but is slowly beginning to increase between age six and age nine. Again, these findings support the theoretical model. The next question is, why does defense use change with development? It's clear that cognitive development makes possible the operation of more cognitively complex defenses. But this fact alone does not explain why use changes, only how it is possible. To understand the why of change, we return to a consideration of the nature of the defense mechanism as a cognitive operation that functions outside of awareness. According to theory, lack of awareness is one of the reasons that defenses are successful. That is, we are unaware that we are deceiving ourselves. In thinking about why children abandon certain defenses and replace them with others, it seemed that this issue of awareness might be critical. Previous research has shown that as children mature, they develop an understanding of how different defenses function. Based on this knowledge, it seemed likely that once a child consciously recognizes a defense and its function, the usefulness of that defense would decrease. In turn, this suggested the possibility that as children mature and develop cognitively, they become able to see through a simple defense like denial. When that happens, they may abandon that defense and in its place adopt another defense that is more complex and, as yet, not understood. To investigate this possibility, we studied children's use of defenses in conjunction with their understanding of how defenses function. Previous research had shown that five and six-year-olds have little understanding of denial and that many 11-year-olds have difficulty understanding projection. Our study included children from two age groups. One group was from the first and second grade in which the shift from denial to projection should be occurring. The other group was from fourth and fifth grade the age in which projection should be predominant defense for the majority of the children. The study was carried out in two sessions. In session one, both groups provided TAT stories that were subsequently coded for defense use. In section two, each child was queried to assess the degree of their defense understanding, that is, how well they understood the way in which the defenses of denial and projection function. Most of, the under, oh, uh, most of the older children understood the function of denial, but among younger children, there was considerable variability. Understanding was rated on an eight-point scale, ranging from no understanding to complete understanding. This slide shows that the majority of the younger children were rated at level four or below, indicating minimal or no understanding but a good number of them had at least partial understanding, level five or above. We then compared the younger children's level of understanding of denial with their use of denial. If our hypothesis is correct, that understanding a defense will preclude its use, then those children who understood the defense should use that defense less. Looking at the slide, we see that those children who have at least partial understanding of denial are less likely to use denial than are those children who have no or minimal understanding of the defense. 
In a similar way, we determined the level of understanding of projection among the older children, when the use of projection is generally predominant. There was considerable variability across the children for understanding projection. The majority of them were rated four or below, indicating minimal or no understanding, but some showed partial or nearly complete understanding. We then compared the use of projection with the level of understanding. As seen in the slide, the children who had no understanding of projection, level two, were more likely to use projection than those who had some understanding of the defense. In fact, these data show a significant linear trend for the relation between use and understanding. These findings then support the theoretical assumption that the usefulness of a defense depends upon its not being consciously understood. Once the function of the defense is consciously realized, its usefulness declines and a new, cognitively more complex and not yet comprehended defense takes its place. The next question is, how do we know we are assessing defenses? From theory, we may identify three conditions that should be met if our method is indeed assessing defenses. First, the use of defense mechanisms should increase under conditions of stress or threat to the self. Second, defenses should protect the individual from psychological upset. And third, excessive reliance on age inappropriate defenses should be associated with psychopathology. For each of these conditions, there is relative research. First, we test the hypothesis that defense use should increase under conditions of experimentally induced stress. Let me say at the outset here that in each of these experimental studies, the participants were fully debriefed at the end of their participation and so did not leave unhappy or upset. In the initial test of this hypothesis, we created an experiment in which elementary school children experienced a mildly stressful situation, and we observed the effect of this stress on the use of defenses. 64 elementary school children participated in this two-session study. And here's the design of the study. During the first session, the children told stories to TAT pictures, which were then coded under minimal stress for defense use. This coding was used to create groups matched for defense. In session two, having established these matched groups, equivalent in their level of defense use, we then provided each group with a different experience. Half of the children experienced success and half experienced failure. To accomplish this, each child participated in a game that involved placing a marble at the top of a multi-level rollway. The object of the game was to see how rapidly the child could get the marble to roll down the track to exit from a chute at the bottom. The task was described to the child as one that depended on personal ability, skill, and motor coordination, and that each child should try to get the marble to roll down the track fast enough to beat the time that most kids your age could beat. In fact, a fictitious time. In addition, the children were told that if they did beat that time, their name attached to a big gold sticker would be placed on the honor board, along with those of other children who had done well. This honor board with awards attached was placed in the child's clear view. To create the situation of success or failure, the experimenter used a stopwatch to measure the time elapsed between placing the marble onto the track and its exit from the bottom chute. Regardless of the actual time elapsed, children in the success condition were told they had beaten the time and their names were put on the honor board. Children in the failure condition were told they had not beaten the necessary time and their name could not be put on the honor board. In a previous pilot study, we had determined that this experimental procedure elicited positive emotions among children experiencing success, but negative affect among those experiencing failure. Following the experience of success or failure, the children again told TAT stories, which were coded for defense use. 
Our interest here was in whether those children who had experienced failure would tell stories in which there was a higher incidence of defense use. If so, then we might conclude that the increased use of these defenses occurred as a way to protect the child from potential upset associated with the arousal of negative emotions. After the storytelling, all children in the failure condition were given another chance. And all of them this time were successful. And this time got to put their names up on the honor board. As may be seen in the slide, the results confirm the prediction that the failure condition would re result in greater use of defenses. Although the success and failure groups had not differed in defense use prior to the game playing session, after the experimental treatment, those children in the failure group used more denial and more projection than did children in the success group. Thus, under conditions of negative affect arousal, the children used age characteristic defenses. In a second study, we applied this experimental paradigm to a group of college students. Students were individually escorted to the experimental room where they lay on a cot with a video recording camera focused directly at them. The experimenter explained that this was a study of creative imagination in college students. Standard TAT instructions were given, again emphasizing the use of imagination. And here's the design of the study. The student was given four TAT cards, one at a time, and asked to tell a story to each card. During this time, after each story, the experimenter responded neutrally, saying, all right, or okay, or here's the next card. However, after the fourth study, for students in the experimental group, the experimenter became extremely critical, saying, these stories are about the worst I've ever heard. <laughs> Could you try and get some better ones? After the fifth story, the criticism continued as it did after the sixth and seventh story. In contrast to the experience of the criticized students, those in the control condition continued to receive the neutral reaction of the experimenter for all eight cards. For both conditions, stories were coded for defense use during the first four and the second four stories. At the end of the eighth story, as a manipulation check, students sat up and completed a questionnaire describing their emotional experience during the experiment. And then they were debriefed. The purpose of the criticism was explained, and assurance was given that the stories they told were quite adequate. As in the children's study, our hypothesis was that the experimental condition of a negative affect creation would increase the use of age-appropriate defenses. As may be seen in the slide, this is what happened. Although the stress and control groups did not differ in defense use for the first four stories, those students who were then criticized significantly increased their use of the age-appropriate defenses of projection and identification. Denial also increased, but the increase was not statistically significant. <clears throat> A third study, also with college students, focused on threatening a specific aspect of the student's identity, namely their sex role orientation. Again, the prediction was that this threat to identity would increase the use of defenses. Here's the design of the study. After providing an initial set of TAT stories, each student was given the BEM sex role inventory, from which a student's predominant sex role orientation may be assessed. On completing the BIM, its purpose was explained to the students, and the examiner left the room for a few minutes to score the student sheet. On return, the student was presented with a complicated table of statistics and was told that their score was either extremely high on the masculine scale or extremely high on the feminine scale. Half of the students were given gender consistent feedback, that is, males were told they scored high on the masculine scale, females that they scored high on the feminine scale, and half were given gender inconsistent feedback. Males told they, told they were scored high on the feminine scale, females on the masculine scale. All students were then engaged in a brief discussion in which they were asked to explain their BEM results. Subsequently, each student wrote three more TAT stories. 
Our interest was in whether, having been provided with bogus feedback regarding their sexual orientation, students who had received gender inconsistent feedback would, as a result of a threat to self, increase their use of defenses. The results of the study were very clear. Before the bogus intervention, the four groups did not differ in their use of defenses. However, after the intervention, those students who had received the gender inconsistent feedback, that is the males with female feedback, the females with male feedback, they showed a dramatic increase in the use of identification and also somewhat of projection, but primarily of identification, the defense that is both age appropriate and appropriate for a threat to the self. One final experimental study was carried out with fourth grade girls. Here is the design for the study. In this study, the social status of each girl had been previously determined using a sociometric rating procedure. Equal number of girls rated as popular, average, neglected, and rejected were then chosen to participate in the laboratory study. When they arrived at the lab, each child told three TAT stories. Then each girl was told that there was another girl down the hall that she would be able to play with using closed circuit TV. In fact, this other girl was a peer actor whose message had been pre-recorded on videotape. When it came time for the play activity to begin, the girls exchanged preliminary descriptions. Then the girl asked the peer via the TV setup if she would like to play a game. The peer, via a pre-recorded message, responded by rejecting this offer to play, saying, no, I don't want to play with you. Following this staged rejection, the child subject told an additional three, three TAT stories. The hypothesis was that peer rejection would result in greatest distress and that greatest, the, thus greatest, sorry, the hypothesis was that peer rejection would result in great distress and that this distress would be greater in girls who were of low social status who had a history of being rejected. As may be seen in the slide, there's a linear function denoting the effect of rejection on the girls as related to sociometric status. Girls who were typically rejected or neglected made greater use of defenses than the average or popular girls. We understood this as being due to the rejected and neglected girls being more sensitive to current peer rejection, more stressed by it. In fact, we were able to show that among the socially maladjusted girls, the lower the social status of the girls, the greatest the increase in stress following rejection, and that this increased stress in turn mediated the subsequent use of defenses. However, among the well-adjusted girls, relative social status did not predict stress increase, which in turn was unrelated to defense use. These four studies then demonstrate that the TAT-based measure of defense mechanisms, as coded by the DMM, produces the results that defense mechanism theory would predict, namely, defense use should increase under conditions of stress or threat to the self. We next test the hypothesis the use of defense mechanisms should protect the individual from psychological upset. According to theory, the function of the defense mechanism is to protect the individual from anxiety and emotional upset. The opportunity to test this assumption arose in connection with a naturally occurring disaster. A group of pre-adolescent boys were engaged in a soccer game when a thunderstorm began. Shortly into the second half of the game, a lightning bolt struck the playing field. All of the players were knocked to the ground. One boy was hit directly by the strike and died. A child clinical psychologist, Dr. Stephen Dollinger, undertook a clinical assessment of these boys. As part of this assessment, he rated their level of emotional upset. This rating of upset was subsequently found to be a valid predictor of the parents' report of the boys' psychological problems 
and it also significantly predicted which boys avoided playing soccer in the next two years. At the time of the assessment, the boys told two stories to pictures depicting lightning. Several years later, these stories were coded with a DMM. It was predicted that those boys with higher defense scores just following the stressful incident would be clinically assessed as showing less psychological upset. That is, using defenses would protect them from psychological upset at that time. The prediction was supported. Those boys who had to higher total defense scores were less upset than those with lower defense scores. Further, when the use of only the two more mature defenses of projection and identification were considered, the relation between defense use and lack of upset was even stronger. Thus, the utilization of defense mechanisms as determined from defense coding was consistent with theory those boys who used more defenses at this time of psychological stress showed fewer signs of upset. We then test the third hypothesis. Excessive reliance on age inappropriate defenses is associated with psychopathology. Data from a study by Sidney Black and Richard Ford of patients at a small hospital offering intensive treatment are informative here. On admission to the Austin Riggs Center, patients provided TAT stories, and these stories were coded for defense use. Patients described as psychotic were compared with those having a personality disorder diagnosis. The results indicated that on entrance to the hospital, the more seriously disturbed patients had higher overall defense scores. And this was true for each of the three defenses. After 15 months of treatment, patients again provided stories to the same TAT cards. After treatment, the psychotic patients had significantly reduced their total defense use. And this was especially true for the defense of denial. Further, when patients were independently rated by clinicians for the degree of improvement after 15 months of treatment, those who were rated most improved had lower defense scores and especially lower denial scores as compared to those who are rated as least improved. This is just one example of clinical studies from a larger body of research literature showing that defenses coded with a defense mechanism manual are related to various psychiatric diagnoses in adults. You may hear more about this topic in our symposium on Saturday afternoon. Defense use has also been found to be related to psychopathology in adolescents and children. In a story, study carried out with Francis Kelly, early adolescents who were diagnosed as conduct disorder were compared with those who had a less severe diagnosis of adjust, adjustment reaction. Those adolescents with the psychiatric diagnosis of conduct disorder made greater use of the immature defense of denial as compared to the less disturbed adolescents diagnosed as adjustment reaction. Also noteworthy is the very low use of identification by the conduct disorder group. In another study, the use of denial by fourth graders, for whom it is age inappropriate, was found to be significantly related to the presence of Achenbach's externalizing and internalizing problems, and to the presence of social anxiety. In contrast, Children of this age who made greater use of identification were found to have higher scores on all of Susan Harder's dimensions of competence. To summarize this section, we've seen that three theoretical assumptions about defense mechanisms are all supported when defenses are assessed from narrative stories coded with the DMM. First, experimentally induced stress increases defense use. Second, defense use protects children from psychological upset. Third, excessive use of age inappropriate defenses is associated with psychopathology in adults, adolescents, and older children. In turn, these results support the validity of this measure for measuring defense mechanisms. <clears throat> Finally, we may ask, is immature defense use by adults a result of regression or fixation? 
The use of immature defenses by psychologically disturbed individuals raises the question of how this comes about. Is it a result of regression to a lower level of functioning, or have these individuals failed to develop more mature forms of defense and instead have remained fixated at an earlier stage of defense development? A definitive answer to this question would require a long-term longitudinal study in which defense use was continually assessed from early childhood to the point in adulthood where pathology was manifest. To my knowledge, no such study exists. There are, however, longitudinal studies of development in which extensive information regarding psychological functioning at early and later stages is available. In one of these, carried out by Jack and Jean Vock, the study began when the children were three years old and continued until age 23 when the participants provided TAT stories. These stories were subsequently coded for defense use. It was thus possible to compare ratings of their preschool psychological functioning with their adult defense functioning. As would be expected for 23-year-olds, the use of denial was relatively rare. However, for some individuals, this defense was predominant. These were not hospitalized patients, but they relied on an immature defense rather than one that would be more developmentally appropriate. Is there some way to understand this anomaly? Because we don't have information regarding their earlier defense use, we cannot know whether the current use of denial reflects a regression from a higher to lower level of functioning. However, we do have information about the psychological status of these young adults when they were three years old, when denial was age appropriate. This information may illuminate the fixation hypothesis. It's possible that if these individuals showed unusual psychological stress during this very early period of development, the defense of denial would be used excessively at that time. As a consequence of this overuse, denial might become firmly, firmly embedded in the child's personality. We look then to discover what these adults who relied on denial at age 23 were like as preschoolers. In preschool, the teachers of these three-year-olds had described those children who later made high use of denial as showing low self-worth, being emotionally labile and inappropriate, lacking intellectual competence, having poor impulse control, poor interpersonal relationships, and lacking pro-social skills. These findings suggest psychological disturbance at this early age and are consistent with the theoretical assumption that psychological disturbance at age three will increase the use of the age-appropriate defense of denial at that time. Under these conditions, we may theorize that these children continued to rely on that defense 20 years later into young adulthood when it is no longer age-appropriate. This is just a sampling of the empirical research studies that have been carried out over the past 40 years. Further studies have dem demonstrated the relation of defense use to changes in big five personality traits in adulthood, to change in identity status, to relationship with Lovinger's ego levels of development, to specific personality disorders, and to physiological change. The results of this work is summarized in two of my books. For those who are interested, I've also prepared a bibliography of my studies that will be available on the table outside of the room. There are many other studies that have been used this approach to investigate defense mechanisms, can, which can be found in, by searching, searching the literature in PsycInfo. In all, it's been a very exciting area of research, this exploration of activity below the surface. I hope I've been able to share this excitement with you. Thank you.
Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Kramer? See, it was crystal clear. <laughs> I'll be around for the next few days, so if you do. One question. So it's butterfly, Bob Shanahan, Rucker, <laughs> what? <laughs> Say a little bit about that. <laughs> I guess that's more exciting. <laughs> um, well, I was a swimmer, <laughs> a competitive swimmer in high school. And uh, I would have been in college, except at that time, there were no women's sports, competitive sports in universities. So, uh, but I, I did swim competitively in high school, and um, I s actually, I set a number of American records, but the most interesting one is the world record in the butterfly. It's a 100-yard butterfly, four lengths of a 25-yard pool, Anything else? <laughs> Pardon me? Oh no, records don't stand very long at all. Oh no, it's long, long gone. Long gone. <laughs> Any other personal questions? <laughs> or otherwise? I encourage you all to, if you're interested, to think about using the TAT as a way of studying defense mechanisms for clinical purposes. I mean, you don't have to have a formal coding pro, uh, system, but uh, if you know about defense mechanisms, if you're sensitive to that way of thinking, you can certainly find uh, interesting information in TAT stories. Thank you again. Thank you.